Good afternoon, everybody. What a beautiful day in Atlanta, Georgia. Fall has been good to us. This is a very exciting Crown Forum afternoon. Normally we call it Crown Forum after dark, but this is afternoon. This is a special convening in which we will impart our regular wisdom and inspiration from great leaders, the ones we have today, will also receive an honorary degree. My name is Leah, Leah Creek Hay. I am professor of English and associate provost for pedagogy and assessment here at Morehouse College. It is my distinct honor to serve as master of Cere mistress of ceremonies today to keep this moving and I'll be very brief with my comments. Most of you have a program. There's a QR code that's being generated um, that you could also see the way the uh, event will flow. And before we get started, we want to first honor our African ancestry, particularly since we are honoring the work of someone who has done much on the continent of Africa. We at Morehouse, we know who we are. We know from whence we originated. And so before the program commences, we ask permission of our elders and our ancestors. And to assist us is a community member known as Mama Akosuwa, who will assist in the pouring of the ancestral libation. After that, I'm gonna come up and acknowledge some pe special people in the audience, and the program will resume. Mama? Good afternoon, everyone. This morning when I woke up, the word that came to me was gratitude. So I am grateful to be able to open up this session to honor the ancestors and thank you very much for asking permission for us to do that. In my culture, you know, because we have different people here that come from different cultures, but I am going to open it up with the Yoruba. Um, prayer. And I'll translate what it means. So, Omi Tutu, I need water. Omi Tutu means, thank you. Oma Tutu. Ashe Tutu. Tutu Ele. Tutu Egun. And Egun are the ancestors. So we always want to make sure that any time that we're gathering, that we open up and we ask permission for the ancestors to bless us, to be with us, and to make sure that everything that is done is done in the order in which the Divine One would like it to be done. So right now, I would like to ask anyone in the audience who would like to invite their ancestors to say their names. I will start with my husband's name, George Edward Tate. Ashe, 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 Ashe. Ashe, 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 
Hache, and Patrice Lumumba. Hache, Ashe, and Asheo. With those remembrances, we now look to those in the audience. There are special members here who have been friends of the Congolese community. There are many organizations represented, and I will quickly read their names. If you are in the audience, please stand. The Congolese Community of Atlanta, First African Presbyterian South, Project South, Malcolm X Grassroots Movement, Community Radio Station WRFG 89.3, Shrine of the Black Madonna, Women Watch Africa, Grupo Nzinga de Capoeira Atlanta, African Association of Georgia, Beacon Hill Black Alliance for Human Rights, Black Alliance for Peace, Black Alliance for Just Immigration. Thank you for all that you do for the cause of the Congolese community. Now, we will have the occasion by one of our students, a Martin Luther King scholar and junior, Mr. Aniyapa Jean-Baptiste, followed by a prayer from another one of our illustrious students, a senior, Mr. Patrick A. Dennis of the Martin Luther King Jr. International Chapel, Chapel Assistance Program. Would you please come forward now? Greetings, community. Bonjour à tous et à toutes. On this auspicious assembly in Cairo's hour, I could hardly think of more appropriate words to give enough justice to the significance of this moment than the quotes from our beloved Moras brother, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Justice is indivisible. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny, and whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Welcome to Crown Forum, a rich and communal tradition of Moras College designed to provide a grounding space where students are connected to and develop their dynamic humanity. There's special attention given to the articulation of and exposure to social justice whereby students understand their responsibility with respect to servant leadership and global citizenry. Today, we are honored to have among us Dr. Denise Mukwege, a man of faith, a man of consequence, whose work, ministry, and call for justice is profoundly resonating in the hearts, minds, and souls of millions on the African continent and across the world. We deeply look forward to finally call Dr. Denis Mukwege, our Moras brother. Je vous remercie. Greetings, everyone. It is an honor to lead you guys in a prayer if everyone would assume, assume a posture of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we humbly ask for your spirit to fall fresh upon us and charge our hearts to lead a life of justice, to reconnect humanity as the broken body parts of God. We call upon you to remind every person here today that they have an instrumental purpose in healing humanity, just as every part of the human body has a role in maintaining health. Dear God, we pray that we not only remember the work 
we were set to do in order to, to restore the body of humanity, but that we carry out our individual functions to co-create the beloved community. We pray that we remember our first collective assignment to protect humanity is to love others as you love us. We pray that through transforming human trauma into human purpose, we will reveal to us the power that you have placed within humanity to choose life in every human over death. Empty our hearts so that we may see that we are a pure vessel for your light to shine through us. Open every ear to answer the divine calling to restore peace, love, justice, and truth to a world that is comfortable in division, fear, greed, and injustice. Make it your will to call every man of Morehouse, every person of this community to be an agent of change. Better yet, an agent of humanity. Dear God, plant a seed of urgency in our hearts today to continue the mission many freedom fighters sacrifice their lives for, to actualize Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream of the beloved community. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen and ashe. Thank you. Now we will have the next segment of our program in which we honor Dr. Dennis Mukwege, our officials here at the college, Kendrick Brown, provost and senior vice president for academic affairs, and our president, Dr. Thomas, will now confer the honorary degree with Dr. Dennis Mukwege. Thank you very much, Dr. Crique. Mr. President, Morehouse will now confer the honorary Doctor of Humane Letters, honoris causa, to Dr. Dennis McQuake. President Thomas, please. First of all, let me say good afternoon. With great pride at Morehouse College, we celebrate that this institution has produced a winner of the Nobel Prize once in our 157 year history. Our globally celebrated alumnus, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr class of 1948 has given us this great distinction. Yet, beyond that glory is the pain and bloodshed along the route that King took to attain civil rights for African Americans from the centuries of slavery and Jim Crow discrimination. Though 60 years has passed since King's significant victory on the global stage of the Nobel Prize, we still lament the presence of the three evils King warned us about, racism, poverty, and war. It is my distinct honor to introduce to our academic community a man who has faced these triple evils to champion the cause of human rights, specifically the fragile human rights of women in the war-torn nations of Africa, where the bodies of women have been used as weapons of revenge and conquest. There is no polite way to discuss this matter except to decry the brutal victimization of African women and ultimately the fabric of the African family. The road to win the Nobel Prize in 2018 alongside Iraq war survivor Nadia Murad for their efforts to end the use of sexual violence as a weapon of war and armed conflict that Dr. McQuege tried to become uniquely qualified to address this issue is paved with determination, preparation, and courage. 
trained in obstetrics and gynecology, Dennis McQuaige has specialized in restoring the health of victims of sexual violence in the Democratic Republic of Congo. There were no medical protocols invented or established for the restoration of women who had been severely disfigured, maimed, and diseased. He established the Ponzi Hospital and Foundation in his hometown of Bukavu in 1999. Dr. McQuaige and his staff have treated thousands, over 30,000, who have fallen victim to such assaults. Most of the abuses have been committed in the context of a long-standing, long-lasting civil war that has cost the lives of more than six million Congolese. Outside of the operating room, Dennis McQuaige has stood up to government officials, galvanized international support, and face death threats to end sexual violence in war and armed conflicts. He is quoted as saying, justice is everyone's business. An echo of our own Dr. King's injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Today, Morehouse College of Atlanta, Georgia in the United States of America stands in solidarity with the women and their people of the Democratic Republic of the Congo and with Dr. Dennis McQuaige as a leader who embodies the values and commitment of our institution. With this honor today, Dennis McQuaige becomes one of three men with the Nobel Prize for Peace who have been honored by Morehouse College. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., class of 1948, President Jimmy Carter, a Nobel laureate and honorary degree recipient, with now Dr. Dennis McQuaige, Honorary Doctorate of Humane Letters, class of 2023. Therefore, by the authority vested in me by the Morehouse College Board of Trustees, it is my honor to confer upon Dr. Dennis McQuaige the Honorary Doctor of Humane Letters, Honoris Causa, with all the rights, privileges, and responsibilities appertaining thereunto. Thank you, Dr. McQuaige, for being with us to receive this honor tonight. We are honored to count you among our number. Thank you. The podium is yours, doctor. You. I'm sorry, I'll do my speech in French. Yes, sir. Mesdames et Messieurs, the Crown Forum, the College, more house. C'est avec humilité que je reçois le diplôme honorifique de l'illustre collège Morehouse et suis très reconnaissant de pouvoir m'adresser à cette prestigieuse tribune à l'occasion du Crown Forum où il m'a été demandé de m'exprimer sur un sujet critique 
et urgent, The Challenge of the Congo. Pour appréhender la complexité de nos luttes actuelles et tracer un chemin vers l'avenir, je souhaite que nous puissions voyager un instant dans le passé, notre passé marqué par les sauts de l'esclavagisme. À la fin du 19e siècle, les puissances occidentales étaient en train de redéfinir leurs relations avec le continent africain et ses habitants. Des lois ont été promulguées pour abolir ou restreindre le commerce, commerce transatlantique des esclaves. Ici aux États-Unis, l'esclavage a été aboli avec la ratification du 13e amendement de la Constitution. Cependant, à mesure que l'esclavage est décliné, le colonialisme, lui, s'étendit. En 1885, les négociations entre les puissances européennes lors de la conférence de Berlin ont abouti au partage de l'Afrique et ont consacré le roi Léopold II de Belgique comme propriétaire d'un pays 80 fois plus grand que le royaume de la Belgique. Et ce pays, c'était le soi-disant État indépendant du Congo. Alors que l'Occident connaissait une révolution industrielle qui apportait progrès et confort aux uns, le cœur de l'Afrique souffrait de l'esclavage et du travail forcé pour satisfaire le besoin des puissances coloniales en ressources naturelles telles que les caoutchoucs. On va se passer des détails. Cette exploitation était impitoyable à exposer les Congolais à la discrimination, aux abus et à la violence institutionnalisée qui a été exacerbée lors de des guerres mondiales où les ressources naturelles du Congo comme le cuivre et l'uranium, ont joué les rôles stratégiques de premier plan. Pendant cette même période, de l'autre côté de l'océan Atlantique, les États-Unis connaissaient une lutte primordiale pour la justice et les droits civils. Même si l'esclavage avait officiellement pris fin, la vie des personnes noires, restait largement menacé et était jalonné par des lynchages quotidiens et la mise en œuvre et des législations ségrégationnistes dites loi Jimmy Crow. Des visionnaires tels que le docteur Martin Luther King Jr. étaient à la pointe de cette lutte, plaidant pour l'égalité raciale et la justice pour tous. Malgré l'éloignement géographique, les luttes au Congo et aux États-Unis partageaient des similitudes profondes. Les deux mouvements cherchaient, en effet, à démanteler les injustices et des inégalités systémiques. Alors que les nations africaines déclaraient les unes après les autres leur indépendance vis-à-vis -vis des puissances coloniales, un sentiment d'espoir et des changements prenaient une ampleur inédite. Cependant, dans le cas du Congo, la vision d'une nation pacifique, indépendante et souveraine de Patrice Lumumba fut tragiquement éphémère. Onze jours après la déclaration de l'indépendance du Congo, une nouvelle guerre de sécession internationalisée commença en raison de la crainte de la perte de contrôle sur les ressources minières au Congo. Mesdames et messieurs, il est bien connu que le Congo occupe une place cruciale dans la géopolitique. Dans son œuvre phare, The Challenge of the Congo, le leader ghanéen Kwame Nkrumah soulignait avec perspicacité 
que le Congo n'est pas seulement une lutte d'un peuple contre le colonialisme belge, il représente plutôt une lutte plus large de tous les peuples africains contre la domination occidentale. Les implications de ces constats sont profondes. Si le Congo devrait atteindre l'indépendance et la prospérité, les puissances occidentales perdraient non seulement l'accès aux richesses du sous-sol congolais, mais elles perdraient également leur mainmise sur tous les continents. 56 ans après que le président Kouma ait écrit ces mots, sa pensée aujourd'hui demeure très pertinente. Alors que je me tiens devant vous aujourd'hui, 63 ans après l'indépendance du Congo, je peux vous relater une histoire, je ne peux pas vous relater une histoire de prospérité, de développement ou de paix. Au lieu de cela, je suis le témoin de la prédation, de la tragédie et de l'injustice de la guerre qui persiste dans l'est de la République démocratique du Congo. La région orientale du Congo, où se trouve une grande majorité des réserves mondiales en étant tungsten, tantal et or, est devenue un champ de bataille. La demande de ces minéraux stratégique a considérablement augmenté à la fin du XXe siècle avec la diffusion généralisée de l'électronique moderne, telle que les smartphones, les ordinateurs portables et les voitures électriques. La lutte pour le contrôle des mines dans l'Est du Congo a ainsi alimenté des conflits armés internationaux ou internationalisés, causant la mort des millions de Congolais. Si je parle des morts, c'est puisque compter, c'est comme si ça n'intéressait plus personne. Des millions de femmes violées et des millions de personnes déplacées. Il s'agit du conflit le plus meurtrier depuis la Seconde Guerre mondiale. Aucune famille n'a été épargnée par la barbarie humaine ayant plongé la population dans un profond traumatisme. En tant que médecin exerçant ma, ma profession dans ces contextes de guerre, j'ai rapidement été le témoin des horreurs infligées aux femmes de ma communauté. La violence sexuelle est devenue une arme de guerre utilisée avec une redoutable efficacité pour terroriser les populations autochtones et contrôler les zones riches à minérer. Confronté à la commission de ces atrocités qui défient l'imagination, nous avons fondé en 1999 l'hôpital de Panzi à Bukavu, un lieu de prise en charge et de refuge pour les survivants de violences sexuelles liées au conflit. Dix ans plus tard, la fondation Panzi a été créée. Ensemble, l'hôpital de Panzi et la fondation ont puis traiter depuis plus de 80 000 survivantes en leur fournissant des soins holistiques. De la prise en charge médicale et psychosociale à l'assistance juridique et socio-économique, nous cherchons tout simplement à fournir les outils et les ressources nécessaires pour que les victimes se transforment en survivantes et en actrices du changement dans notre société. Malheureusement, Malgré le temps qui passe, nos services continuent d'être sollicités de manière croissante, nous rappelant chaque jour que les horaires inhérentes au conflit continuent jusqu'à ces jours. Dès les débuts de la guerre, les cas de viol étaient souvent marqués par une violence extrême. Cette violence pouvait entraîner une complication médicale connue sous le nom de fistule. Une fistule, en fait, il s'agit d'une communication anormale entre la vessie et le vagin ou entre les rectums et les vagins. Ça peut être dû à un euh, traumatisme post-viol ou ça peut être dû à un accouchement difficile. Et depuis 1999, nous avons traité près de 9000 cas de fistule à Panzi à travers des interventions 
chirurgical. Le premier traitement réussi d'une fistule est souvent attribué à James Mario Sims, un médecin américain blanc, parfois appelé le père de la gynécologie moderne. Mais Sims exerçait la médecine en Alabama au milieu du 19e siècle et a réalisé, a réalisé de nombreuses interventions chirurgicales expérimentales sur des femmes esclaves noires atteintes de fistules. Ces expériences ont eu lieu en dehors d'un cadre hospitalier et de manière choquante. Aucune anesthésie n'était administrée pendant ces interventions expérimentales. Mesdames et messieurs, je suis reconnaissant aujourd'hui de pouvoir utiliser les compétences médicales transmises par mes prédécesseurs pour réparer les corps des femmes de mon pays. Cependant, je ne peux ignorer l'exploitation des corps des femmes sur lesquels le docteur Sims a opéré. Et aujourd'hui, je ne peux être que profondément accablé par le fait que malgré deux siècles de distance, le corps de la femme continue d'être torturé. Bien que l'utilisation du viol comme arme de guerre ne se produise pas sur une table chirurgicale, son intention et la douleur infligée ne sont pas en grave. C'est inacceptable. Mais la guerre dans l'Est de la RDC et ses conséquences dramatiques pour les femmes ne sont que les symptômes d'un problème plus vaste. Pendant près de 150 ans, le Congo a été la cible d'une exploitation qui dépasse tout entendement. De nombreux intérêts étrangers bénéficient de l'instabilité et du chaos comme en témoigne l'agression récente soutenue par des régimes voisins tels que ceux de Kigali et de Kampala. Les leaders de ces pays exploitent cette économie de guerre et le commerce des minéraux de sang depuis des décennies. Des politiciens et des autorités cupides collaborent avec les rebelles et des seigneurs de guerre, tous animés par le désir de s'approprier une part du gâteau dans cette bijouterie à ciel ouvert qui est la République démocratique du Congo. Aujourd'hui, en ce moment même, mon pays est pillé avec la complicité des dirigeants congolais et de multinationales, et ceci en toute impunité, dans l'indifférence totale de la communauté internationale. Ainsi, nous faisons des constats amers que malgré l'abolition de l'esclavage et l'ère des indépendances, le peuple congolais, à l'instar d'autres communautés noires à travers le monde, fait toujours l'objet d'une forme camouflée d'esclavage et d'exploitation brutale qui nous maintient dans des conditions infra-humaines. Mesdames et messieurs, le temps est venu de reconnaître les causes profondes qui alimentent les cycles de violence à l'est du Congo. Les chemins de la paix durable est possible. Nous devons d'abord reconnaître les rôles des acteurs nationaux et internationaux dans la perpétuation de ces conflits. Nous devons reconnaître le lien entre les violations graves des droits humains et l'exploitation illégale et le commerce illicite des minéraux stratégiques et des ressources naturelles. Nous devons mettre fin à la culture de l'impunité qui permet aux auteurs des violences sexuelles et d'autres crimes d'échapper à la justice. Ainsi, nous exhortons les États-Unis à sanctionner les individus qui sont connus tant nationaux qu'étrangers, responsables de la déstabilisation de la région des Grands Lacs et de la mise en péril de la démocratie en République démocratique du Congo. De plus, pour enrayer les cycles de la violence armée, nous plaidons en faveur d'un commerce des minéraux transparent qui doit être exempt des conflits. Il faut éviter le travail des enfants dans les mines, de l'exploitation sexuelle et surtout ne pas créer des dégâts environnementaux. À mesure que l'Occident se tourne vers une économie verte pour faire face au changement climatique, nous devons impérativement établir des chaînes d'approvisionnement propres qui garantissent la transparence de l'extraction 
jusqu'au point de vente de produits finaux dans le monde entier, et ceci y compris aux États-Unis. En outre, nous soutenons également, aux côtés des victimes et des survivants, de la création d'un tribunal similaire à Nuremberg pour le Congo. Nous plaidons aussi pour l'adoption et la mise en œuvre d'une stratégie holistique de justice transitionnelle, car il n'y aura pas de paix durable sans la justice, la vérité et des réparations. Il est temps d'établir les liens étroits entre la prévention des conflits, d'une part la justice transitionnelle, l'état des droits et la consolidation de la paix dans notre région. Enfin, nous exhortons vivement les partenaires clés de la République démocratique du Congo, y compris les États-Unis, à défendre leurs valeurs fondamentales. Vous avez des valeurs fondamentales. Vous devez les défendre dans vos relations extérieures et œuvrer pour un véritable changement démocratique lors des élections générales qui sont prévues en République démocratique du Congo cette année. L'environnement préélectoral est tendu en raison des préoccupations concernant l'indépendance de la Commission électorale et de la Cour constitutionnelle. Les importantes restrictions de l'espace démocratique et des tentatives d'exclusion des leaders de l'opposition de la course à la présidentielle. Face à ces signaux alarmants, il est impératif d'exercer une pression en faveur d'une alternance démocratique véritable et de surveiller étroitement le processus électoral. Nous devons nous assurer que les résultats des élections reflètent véritablement la volonté du peuple congolais pour éviter une farce électorale et rompre avec les crises de légitimité récurrentes qui ont enclenché les cycles de violence et d'instabilité politique et sécuritaire, et ceci c'est depuis des décennies. Mesdames et messieurs, les défis du Congo et les défis de chacun de nous. C'est un défi pour l'égalité entre les sexes, les classes et même l'égalité entre les nations. C'est le défi pour une économie mondiale équitable et non destructrice. Car chacun de nous détient une partie du Congo dans sa poche, dans son téléphone, nous tous dans nos ordinateurs. Nous avons une petite partie du Congo et dans les batteries de nos voitures électriques qui sont dites euh, vertes. Alors que mon temps avec vous touche à sa fin, je me souviens que nous sommes ici à Morehouse College, une université historiquement noire. Le Morehouse College a longtemps été un phare d'excellence, non seulement en matière académique, mais aussi en favorisant une culture de leadership responsable et de masculinité positive. Aujourd'hui, nous comptons sur vos voix pour promouvoir un changement positif tant aux États-Unis que dans le monde entier. Il est temps d'éradiquer l'humanisme sélectif et les doubles standards qui sapent tout simplement la confiance dans les institutions internationales et dans le multilatéralisme. De plus, nous exhortons à encourager vos dirigeants à privilégier la dignité humaine plutôt que les intérêts économiques et financiers en alignant la géopolitique sur les valeurs fondamentales gravées dans le marbre des monuments et mémoriaux de cette nation. Pour embrasser vraiment la liberté et la justice, nous devons aussi défendre l'égalité des sexes et les droits des femmes. Il est essentiel de reconnaître que l'autonomisation des des femmes et la promotion de la masculinité positive sont fondamentales pour parvenir à une société juste et équitable. Au mot du docteur Martin Luther King Jr., personne n'est libre tant que tout le monde n'est pas libre. Nos destins sont interconnectés et les quêtes de justice au Congo et aux États-Unis, sont profondément liés. Avec vous, je partage des enceintes, des liens et des barrières systémiques qui persistent dans nos sociétés. 
mais ensemble, indignons-nous et résistons contre l'injustice et les, les inégalités. Ensemble, luttons contre la prédation des ressources naturelles à l'est de la République démocratique du Congo. Ensemble, luttons contre l'esclavage camouflé du peuple congolais pour la libération de notre humanité. Je vous remercie. Yes. 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 Dr. McQuaid, um, I just want to thank you for bringing uh, your message to us. Um, I have to say that uh, I was moved by it personally uh, and reminded of the collective struggle that we all have to engage in to recognize and liberate the humanity that joins us all across the globe. So, uh, again, thank you. Thank you. And uh, thank you for accepting uh, our honor uh, of the Honorary Doctorate of Humane Letters. We are uh, happy and inspired to now count you among our number. So with that, Dr. Crique, do you want to? We're going we're gonna to have questions and answers, and you're going to moderate, right? With Dr. Livingston? That was wonderful. We cannot thank you enough for all that you've done. My colleague, Dr. Samuel Livingston and Tyra Monga. Monga will do a call to action and moderate the question and answers. So do you want to begin, Sam, call to action? Yes. And actually, in the interest of time, uh, Sister Tyra Monga, who is a longtime uh, member of Friends of the Congo, which beat more house to the punch by giving um, uh, Dr. Mukwege our Patrice Lumumba Award um, in 2020. And Sister Tyra was instrumental in that. And also the year before that, giving uh, Julianne Lumumba, the daughter of Patrice Lumumba, oh, the year after, I'm sorry, the, uh, the Lumumba Award. So with that, um, Sister Tyra will give the call to, the call to action um, Dr. McQuaige's words were not just eloquent and beautiful, and they were. And thank you again, Dr. McQuaige. Absolutely. But they, if you felt, I can't speak French, not at all, <laughs> um, but you felt the energy. And I hope you will take that and as a, as a call to actually get involved. And with that, Sister Tyra, if you would bring the call. And then we'll have questions and answers um, before we dismiss. Good afternoon. I'm Tyra Alafia Yangamwanga. I'm to give a call to action in terms of what we can do, maybe even what we ought to do or think about doing. I'm going to share a quote with you first. Uh, it's a quote by a person that many of you are familiar with his life's legacy for the most part. Let's see if you can guess who it is. Quote, as long as we think we should get Mississippi straight before we worry about the Congo, you'll never get Mississippi straight. 
I'm going to repeat this and say it a little differently so I can't say, quote, as long as we think we should get Mississippi straight before we worry about doing something about the Congo, you'll never get Mississippi or Georgia or Texas poppy in the places. You'll never get them straight. We've got to do something. Does anyone know? I'm sorry, I'm going to stop before I go on. Can anyone know who that quote, the previous one, might have come from? El Haj Malik Shabazz, the ancestor, the great end. Excuse me, the words are just falling in different kinds of ways. So after listening to this incredible man and the unbelievable work that he does, you might want to ask yourself, well, what can I do? What can we do to help out? So I'm going to list some of those things, and um, yeah, maybe Dr. McQuaidy can add something to it as well. You can go to PonziHospital.org to get information about the Ponzi Foundation. His work at Ponzi in the City of Hope, where the City of Hope is what the compound is called, as well as um, the communities around and the entire uh, country of the Congo. What you can do for the Ponzi Foundation, which is a community of survivors, advocates, and supporters, you can give financially or by the giving of your time and energy advocating for free freedom in the Congo. Whatever you do, you can um, you will always be contribu- contributing to stopping the tactical sexual violence that happened in the Congo. So go there, Ponzi foundation.org and I remember a scan a, a code being us okay. uh, if, if Kennard would you pull up the QR code for the program for those who did not receive okay great excellent yeah. <laughs> another thing that you can do is that you can join an organization you can join any organization but more specifically you can join us Friends of the Congo We work along with brothers and sisters of the Congo, partnering with groups, working as advocates for women, children, children in the mines, rescue program, youth and artists, health clinics and schools, groups dealing with climate justice, environmental racism exists everywhere. And They also deal with um, leadership training and other things that you can find out more by going to using the scan. Is this the scan that we're talking about? This is for the program. Oh, okay. All right. Not for Friends of the Congo. Okay. My So go to friendsofthecongo.org or leave your information outside on a contact, uh, a sheet that we Another way that you can get involved is to educate yourself, get informed, stay informed, and stay up to date. You can read more books, like Dr. McQuaggy's latest book, a powerful name of the book is Power of Women. You can also do research on any topic in response to any questions you may have about the Congo. Google it. That's one of the best things that uh, 
we have access to in technology because of technology. And while you're on the subject of being informed, you can have an opportunity to get a wealth of information on the DR Congo by participating in Friends of the Congo's flagship event called Congo Week, themed Breaking the Silence. It's one of my very favorite events of the year, and it happens between October 15th and the 31st. Every day there is a myriad of things that you can participate in, watch, take part in, and ask questions. Also, during Congo Week, um, there are lots of things happening in the form of discussions and forums, interviews, reports, special film screening, video shows, voices, stories of Congolese women, youth, villagers, cultural presentations with performances by those folks in Congo and Sorry. Go ahead. And I thought that we would have the scan code up, um, but outside I think we've got something at the table that may not be marked Friends of Congo, but it's where the books are. Okay. And uh, make sure that what you um, do is look for, when we're talking about Congo Week, look for the schedule that isn't quite apparent on the website, I understand, but it's coming. And you can take a look at all the events that happened in the past. Global ministries, students across the world and universities and their staffs, faculties, uh, churches, places um, of worship, children, you have voices of children and women. All of these things will go on during Congo Week. So I want to return to the things that you can do and think about doing, and there's more if you go on both of those websites, PonziFoundation.org and FriendsOfCongo.org. Bring your talents, bring your skills, interests, and knowledge or expertise to be a part of the global, global movement to support the Congo. Each and every one of you can do something. You can do something to bring an end to the suffering and work with our Congolese brothers and sisters to help bring about change for a more triumphant Congo because of who we have in it doing the work. Okay, with that, um, I do have to say that uh, we have a chapter of Friends of the Congo here in Atlanta. Just well, oh, my goodness, good to see you. Yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Former student, um, just well, Musawa Gumbi. I know I messed the name up, but former student who did phenomenal work with Friends of the Congo. Um, we have a chapter here. Get involved in the same way that we vote for the you know our candidates who have pro progressive issues progressive um platforms on racial issues we need to support the congo i argue like dr mukwege that we really owe the united states government owes congo reparations we need to expand that reparations movement now before we bring up and as you think about your questions say reparations well yes the minerals but the u.s owes reparations for us <laughs> 24 to 60 percent excuse me 50 percent of all african-american men were brought from congo and angola so this is not just well it is the minerals that is that is of course very 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 important but it's a human rights issue as well um we have time for a for a couple of questions um, do we want to take three, three questions? Um, if any students, community members would like to, um, ask a question of Dr. Mukwege, please approach the microphone here at the, um, at the front of the stage. And if we could have, yes, sir, you come up and, and students, we need a student also. 
come up and DeAndre is can come up. So it looks like and those four will be the only folks that we'll that we'll be able to take questions from. Okay? Is that okay, Dr. McQuigan? This Uh, je m'appelle au nom de Michel. Je m'appelle au nom de Michel. Uh, I'm going to ask my question in English. And um, it will be just a little bit different from what we've been having. But um, speaking of the Banyamulenge issue in the DRC, we've heard you say Tutsi are criminals. Referring to us, it is the same people who killed since 1996. You speak against Congolese massacre in different provinces, but you didn't denounce killing, targeting the Banyamulenge in South Kivu. Why is it so hard for you to stand for the Banyamulenge just you did for the women? And we did appreciate that, sir. And um, we, we just want for you to be the normal, uh, the noble prize for all because your voice can go over the world. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Would you like to address? Yes, sir, please. Maybe I can attack this. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, when you ask if I'm not talking about the Banyamulenga, I think that you are not really informed. You should maybe look for information and maybe visit my my Twitter, and you can see that when it happened to Banyamulenge, and I consider that I can't talk about one people, I'm talking about human. And if Banyamulenge are Congolese, if Banyamulenge are human, I don't need to talk about the Bashi, the uh, Bakongo, Baluba. This is a way just to, to get this division. I think that if you want really to work together, we don't need to talk about types. We don't need to talk about types. I think that we are all African, and I think that we need to understand that we need to come together and work together for peace and development. And not and not be talking and not be talking always about just one type. The second thing that I want to tell you is that uh, maybe I talk about the same R killing again. And this is right. Because if you can see, uh, for example, he's even not a Banyamulenge, Bissimo, Bertrand. He starts with Afdel. He was after in LCD and uh, uh, CNDP. And today he's in uh, M23. He's the same. Well, do you want me to change his identity? Because, and he's not Banyamulenge. So they are the same who are creating trouble in, in Congo, and we know them. That is the reason we are asking that justice is only the way that we can get peace in Congo, is to get a transitional justice. And I will not change my way to say sales. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mokwede, for gracing us uh, with your presence and speaking for us today. Um, I wanted to ask, Given the place of HBCUs in the history of attaining black liberation, what are your views on the shift towards capitalist values being upheld by our institutions? And how do we move towards values rooted in Pan-Africanism and black liberation on an institutional level? Yeah, I, I think that when I, I talk about what happened, for example, for us in Congo, I have my impression is that Sometimes we have the impression that now we are free, but uh, for me, uh, we're still in the same situation. And I think that uh, all of, yeah, the black people should be conscious that we need to do more because the way that we are living in the society, for me, is not correct. The, the, uh, po uh, the Congolese population, for example, now, uh, since now more than 100 and 40 years, they are suffering for the same reason. You know that uh, in, uh, with uh, uh, King Leopold II, 
Congo lose 10 million of people. If you can read, for example, Adam, Ochil Adam, he described it clear how many people who died in, in Congo at this moment. And I think that we should aim at the level of the institution to understand that we need to do more. We have laws, we have system, but it's not enough for the black people to be really free. And I travel a lot and I can see it everywhere. We are, the black people are living in misery. Uh, the, the black people are living without job. If there is people without job in many countries. And I think that we need to work at different level, including the institutional, institutional level to work against this kind of discrimination. Because for me, it, it's a, uh, even if we have the impression that we have good laws, but this laws is not enough implemented, especially for the black people. And I mean Congo. Congo is a, is a country of black people. But how can you understand what is happening in Congo? Even with our own authorities, what they are doing against their own population, just for the interests of other uh, countries, especially uh, the, the, the Western country, is not normal. So I think that this question really we need to talk about it and try not only to talk about uh, at the individual levels, but to talk about or on the institutional levels. Thank you. That, I, I do want to say Noel's uh, question. We should think about offering African languages at HBCUs. Every HBCU needs to specialize in two or three or four African languages. <laughs> But sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't resist. <laughs> uh, but George, I'm a Pell Deshaun Brooks, uh, freshman. Um, and I want to just like start off by saying, like typically I, as a black male, like when seeing people like you in such high positions to gaining like Nobel uh, Peace Prizes, like um, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, um, it just like makes me feel like I can do anything in general. So I wanted to thank you for that. Um, for so thank you. Uh, second, uh, my question is, um, what motivated you to getting to this position? Like what brought you here? How did you get here? Yeah. Uh, I really, um, I think I was at a place and something bad happened to the people, to the human like me, and I was just forced to act and, and help them. And uh, I never asked to get any position. I'm very happy to serve. And I think that uh, to get a position is not really the most important thing. I think that the most important thing is to serve the human like yourself. Thank you. Hello. Good afternoon, doctor. Um, I wanted to ask a question, uh, something that gentlemen here uh, very eloquently articulated. And one thing that was I was pondering in my mind was the uh, topic of reparations. Um, when we talk about reparations and expanding the reparations uh, topic, especially not only amongst uh, the African American and American descendants of slaves, but also uh, the conversation around uh the African nations, various African nations, right? Not only the Congo, um, but other African nations that uh, Western powers are taking advantage of and mining resources out of. And so I guess, how do we approach this conversation given that uh, the impact would be so grand and we're going after institutions that are in their nature, uh, uh, fu it, fundamentally uh, they constitute uh, really the, the, the the mantle of the white power structure that so called that we would call it right and so in terms of like you know to the airline industry and like all that sorry I know I'm you know it's kind of a loaded cover conversation but how how do we approach this conversation given that it impacts social and political and economic interests not only of the United States but of the European powers uh, I was trying to answer. But uh, I know when, for example, when it comes to to reparation, if I if I understood, 
the big problem is that when we talk about reparation, I have impression that we still are afraid to talk about this question. And um, I'm leading a global survival fund for victims of sexual violence. And when I'm talking with countries to try to bring them in this global survival fund to support victims of sexual violence, I have impression that country they are thinking more about their own reparations that they should do for what they did in uh, for their own population or for example in Amer in america what happened to uh, afghan america people so reparation for me is really very important it's not only uh, to get something but it to be recognized what happened to you reparation is a way to give you your place and also to treat the one who maybe commit this crime against you to feel that what, hap what I did was bad. And my impression is that since we don't accept that something bad happened to, for example, all the black people today well, who are living in America, but also for the black people living in, in, in many countries in Africa, as he said, many black Americans come from Angola, and from, from Congo, but also all our culture in Congo was completely destroyed after this, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the slavery. So I think that to talk about reparation should be a way to sit together and talk about what happened and each party should accept what they did and just say, this was bad. But for me, since we don't talk about reparation, we're just going to do bad things and we'll do it maybe consciously, but also we can do it without knowing that we are doing bad things. And especially for the victims, I can say that uh, the victim, in, for example, in my country, I have an impression that most of them are just developing the uh, Stockholm Syndrome. They have an impression that uh, the perpetrators are helping them. And when we are in this situation where we have impression that uh, what happened, some, someone who did a crime against you, you have impression that he is protecting you. So you will be slave for all the life because you have impression that this is my protection. So I think that we need to work on reparation, not only because we want to, to name uh, the perpetrator, but it's very important for the perpetrator to know that this is not good for to do it for another human, but also for victims to know that uh, my, my position is not what position that I should keep in the society. And today, I have impression, if, if, if I can see in my own country, I have impression that many people are just applauding their, their uh, the perpetrators, because they have impression that the perpetrators become their protector. And we need really to talk, to, to, to know the truth, and really reparation is a way to accept what happened and just try to recognize what happened. And it's a step, very important step to do in many situations. I know that when I approach some countries, they are just saying, oh, no, we don't want to go in this program. And it's especially because maybe something happened in their own country and they don't want to uh, come up with this question. But for me, without reparation, all the bad things will go on in our society. Thank you. And I'm sorry, we, this young man in the white shirt is the last person who will have a question, sir. I'm sorry. And is that okay, Doc? Or do you yeah. that? Is that yeah. the, the suits, yes, sir. Just, just to do the young man here. I'm sorry, sir. Thank you. Bon après-midi. Good afternoon. I will speak in my language because my country, we have over 400 languages. I will speak in Lingala so you can really understand me. Uh, Dr. Mpwe, bonsoir. Bonsoir. Uh, 
Nous avons fait un autre temps. Parfait, thank you. Question à moi, les adieux pour eux. Au lobby, nous avons dit depuis 1999, si le lot, si. This, this is my question. You say that you've been working since 1999. Uh, today we are in 2023. There are many women who have been raped. Many children who lost their uh, families. And the families that lost their siblings. We see you here today. This is my question. To work you've been doing for this long time. What do you have with you so that this whole suffering can end? Because out here we are suffering. We are suffering from what's going on in the country. What do you have today? What can you tell us today? So, uh, to give us hope. We are telling that this will end. Merci. Thank you. Bon, uh, I to answer in English or in English. I will answer in English. Well, in fact, I think that the question in Congo is what I was discussing with someone who talked about, about reparation. And I think that when our population, we, we are applauding people who are responsible for all our suffering. And I have impression that the population don't understand that they are suffering. And that is the reason I said that we still in the sla slavery in, in, in my country because the population is suffering. How can you understand that in a country as Congo? As a country, we have land. We, it's raining nine months per, per year. Uh, we have minerals. We have all the opportunities that you can, you can get. But the big problem is that if yourself you don't make the diagnosis and know exactly what is your problem, you can't wait someone coming from outside to solve your problem. It will never happen. And I think that the problem of Congo is the Congolese problem. And the Congolese have to take responsibility to change things. And you can be everywhere where we can be in, in America, in Europe, but your country is Congo. And each time they will remind you that you are Congolese. And the best things for you should be that Congo can be a country with peaceful, with development and so on. And no one will do it. You have to understand that it's only Congolese who can do it. Today, my impression is that no one wants that Congo can get peace. Because with the war, everyone is getting a lot of benefit and no one can really like to get peace in Congo. It's only Congolese who have to do it. Thank you. Happy progress. And if you to summit it, I'll be done. So it's going to say. That, um, <laughs> Dr. Frike is going to come up and uh, dismiss us. I do want to say um, that Dr. Mukwege's words um, will go as a part, go down as a part of the program. And we will actually going to use that speech to teach a part of the Congo curriculum here at Morehouse College. So this is historic for the fact that he is here. But we're going to continue to work on these issues, and none of them are easy. They're, none of them are easy, but we do want, we, so I just want to thank Dr. Mukwege again. And I want to, and I want to thank Dr. Samuel Livingston, my colleague, please, for championing this honorary degree for Dr. Mukwege and bringing him to our attention to make sure that he is here. That wasn't just me though. 
Yeah, I know. The Africana Studies Department. And I want to just say before I close that Dr. Livingston, the only reason I'm, he invited me to be the MC is because we started out together and we envisioned almost, what, 15 years ago? that we would have more African awareness activities. Um, our colleague, Cynthia Hewitt, was with us. She brought Wangari Matai, also a Nobel Laureate of Peace, who's now deceased. She brought her to Morehouse. So this is something we envisioned when we were junior faculty, just beginning. And so I'm honored that he rem remembered me. I formed, uh, at that time, a Nobel Laureate course um, that is taught every other year to highlight uh, African and African-American leadership amongst those who have received that very coveted prize so that it could be studied. So I want to just uh, say that this is an evolution. Uh, this is a, a manifestation of an evolution of thought that has come to pass. And we have the right leadership uh, with Dr. Thomas and Dr. Brown to make these things happen. And we're look for, looking more forward to our uh, African awareness growing on this campus and our students becoming empowered to embrace their heritage and to make an impact. Our celebration and engagement today does not end with this program. We are getting ready to have a grand celebration and festivity in the African American Hall of Fame. You will have a little walk from this building down the corridor of, um, what's that street, Brown Street, to um, the African American Hall of Fame. It will begin at five and go until pr approximately seven. I want to thank uh, Dr. S I, mean, I want to thank Stephanie Whitaker and the staff of the Ray Charles Performing Arts Center for all of the assistance um, in hosting us here. Mr. Henry Goodgame, uh, Vice President of External Relations uh, for helping to manage all that was necessary to accommodate this occasion and many, many others. And I wanna thank you audience, you were most most attentive and I think we've bonded in ways in which we have not before. I think we are all more empowered. And with that, I bid you adieu until I see you at the reception where we can talk some more. <laughs>